Hi, my name is Anton Kachatko. I'm a software engineer and ARM, and I'm working on open source tools for uh, model optimization for ARM and PU, CPUs and GPUs. So today I'll be talking about these tools and uh, I will briefly uh, go through what NPUs are, as we are currently mostly targeting uh, ARM NPUs, and I'll then talk about uh, some techniques and uh, what tools we develop to enable those techniques, and then run through a few results to show examples of how tools actually work. Uh, so neural processing. Uh, machine learning applications uh, in modern life find their way in all spheres uh, of our activities as, as human beings. And as such, we see artificial intelligence being deployed in all sorts of devices and making an impact on virtually every market. Machine learning is run on traditional uh, compute units such as CPUs and GPUs, where it takes advantage of um, flexibility um, enabled by CPUs and also higher, more scalable throughput and performance uh, given by GPUs. However, to achieve the highest uh, power performance ratio while taking up the smallest part of the chip's real estate, more we, we see that more and more vendors uh, choose dedicated compute units. Uh, which in ARM we call NPUs, Neural Processing Units, uh, which are designed specifically to handle machine learning workload. And uh, here we're not only talking about uh, dedicated uh, NPUs uh, to, uh, to run a user application code or models. Uh, we're also talking about uh, small dedicated units put inside uh, other parts of SOC, such as uh, say, uh, uh, memory controllers or some error corrections in, say, uh, ISP blocks and so on and so on. So what makes NPUs the most efficient machine learning compute engines out there? Uh, obviously, a very generic answer and very sensible that <laughs> because they are actually specifically designed to, uh, to execute such workload. Uh, however, uh, the, the most important thing from our point of view is that they are designed to minimize the data movement, particularly in, in and out of the NPU. And in ARM ethos NPUs, uh, we're addressed by uh, having a dedicated distributed local uh, SRAM architecture that allows up to 90% of the data access to occur locally, uh, which reduce loading on system DRAM and uh, helps achieve uh, higher market utilization. Another feature of our NPUs that help to reduce the load on the memory subsystem is the efficient leveraging of the software and hardware compression. Uh, so we offer at the moment two different types of uh, different families of NPUs uh, for embedded and mobile or client markets. So the first one is a CU, uh, which are targeting uh, small embedded systems, which are normally built around Cortex uh, M processor or uh, with Cortex M processor as a host processor in the system. And uh, we don't really know all the applications and issues where these, devi uh, where these devices actually go to. Uh, our main task is to enable partners, but what we know is that a lot of these devices are battery powered and they should stay operational for up to two years without access to the main uh, power supply or battery change or battery charge. So the very low of power consumption here is crucial and that's where the data, low data movement come in place as well. So examples of these applications um, are multitude, uh, different wearables, uh, uh, IoT endpoints, radiant audio, audio processing, smart cameras. Very often these devices uh, play the role of a gateway uh, device so that they they always stay on and provide the initial trigger initial analysis to trigger if necessary the bigger device which is normally in normal standby operation would be basically powered down one example of such applications would be uh, face id for example uh, 
Our bigger NPUs, Ethos M, uh, they're targeted at high throughput, more computationally powerful systems, such as um, mobile phones, more sophisticated smart cameras, um, other consumer devices, industrial gateways, and automotive infotainment systems. Uh, typically, these devices would be in a system controlled by a bigger Cortex A uh, uh, processors, which run um, full operating systems such as Linux. Uh, so, once we have an ARM NPU in our system, how can we start using it and using it efficiently? Um, so, first of all, to actually be able to run the models on, on these devices, we need to convert uh, a neural network model to, to the integer 8 format or quantize it. Uh, currently, ethos uh, families, both ethos families of um, MNPUs, they, uh, they, they support uh, either 8-bit or 16-bit integers. So you, uh, you can't run the original floating point model on them. So it is important to convert them, uh, to quantize them. And uh, uh, on the flip side, it gives uh, immediate benefit of small model size. It's uh, integer eight, uh, for example, data type is four times smaller than 14 points at two. So hence we get a smaller model size when all the tensors effectively compressed almost for a factor of four. The next step is to minimize the data movement in and out of NPU core and improve the efficiency of the transfers that still need to happen. The model can be further optimized by enabling uh, weight compression techniques that we have built into our hardware devices. And this can additionally give the power and performance uh, boost by a factor from 1.2 up to, for some models we see up to two times acceleration while still maintaining the accuracy of the original model or staying fairly close to it, which makes sense in real life applications. Um, and to achieve this, this is where the tooling becomes important. Uh, and, um, and that would be the next part of what I'm going to talk about. So first of all, I wanted to just recap how, from our point of view, the model development flow uh, looks like. Uh, typically, in the most generic, uh, generic case, uh, uh, people would start from identifying, defining the use case, obviously, and identifying the potential model candidates, uh, uh, architectures. Uh, not everyone goes and design their own brand, brand new architecture. Not many people, very often people will just go and reuse existing ones. And just it's a matter of choice of architecture that, uh, that is appropriate for the use case. Then they will tailor that model for their specific use case. That would be, uh, that's normally spans from the selecting the appropriate or building their own data set that characterize the use case. Uh, and then maybe retrain the model with the data set in mind, maybe reducing the number of classes, for example, in the image specification or support fewer or more objects than the original network would do for the object detection network, for example. Uh, then when, uh, when you're quite certain with what model architecture you want from the accuracy point of view, for example, you, you may want to go and uh, adapt it to a particular hardware that uh, the network will be run on. And this, uh, this, depending on the use case, it could be, for example, reducing or uh, reducing uh, the size of the, for example, filter banks and, con and, and convolutional filters or conventional layers or making say size of those filters uh, a fraction of not fraction sorry uh, uh, integer number of particular uh, particular value to make them say seem destruction friendly and so on and so on so on. Once that is done uh, we have basically network ready to ready to be converted for deployment for example but uh, this is where additional steps, which we call inference optimizations and conversions come to the play. And this is what we're focusing as a part of model conditioning steps. And uh, uh, here, this is where techniques like pruning, clustering come into play and also quantization, uh, whether it is uh, training time quantization or post-training quantization. Uh, and the final steps are compiling the model into executable binary or, prepare, or packaging it and deploying it in the uh, for the uh, 
interpreted uh, inference runtime stack, such as, say, uh, TFLight runtime or Armonem, something like that. So talking about model conditioning specifically, uh, in ARM, we uh, our strategy is to try to democratize access to uh, to the efficient um, machine learning inference, and uh, we see that the the best way to do it is to enable uh, optimizations uh, critical for the hardware through uh, in open source projects and open source frameworks, and that's what we've been doing for the last now a couple of years, uh, uh, working closely with the uh, uh, with the Google TensorFlow project and particularly contributing into the TensorFlow Lite and TensorFlow Model Optimization Toolkit uh, projects. And on this slide, I'll uh, outline uh, contributions made both by Google Team and by ourselves that enable kind of the full optimization flow where we start with the Keras model, which would be in false in point 32. Most of the time it will be pre-trained. Uh, then we can run it through different optimizations like pruning, clustering, quantization aware training. And then as a result, we have still a floating point Keras model, but it has a specific uh, properties induced in, uh, in the weight tensors so that they become more, pr uh, more friendly to various compression techniques. And once we have that model, we can uh, pass it on to TensorFlow Lite converter, and the which uh, will produce the fully quantized model ready for deployment on the uh, on the NPUs. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to highlight here is what has been um, uh, mm -hmm. something of our particular attention uh, recently, uh, what we call collaborative optimizations. So the Motivation here, uh, intuitively very, very simple. It's the idea of combining as many applicable uh, optimizations uh, together in one optimization flow and make sure that they don't mutually destroy the effect of each other. So in this diagram here, the example would be, we have the original model and then we prune it. And then after that, what pruning does, it introduces um, sparsity, it introduces a lot of zero weights in the model. But then uh, we may want to apply clustering, which reduces the number of unique weights. So if, uh, uh, along with zeros, you can have some other weights, but instead of like thousand of uh, potentially various values, you may want to, uh, to limit those to like um, to something smaller, like 32 or 16. And, but while doing that, if uh, your clustering algorithm is not aware of um, sparsity of the need of preserving zeros, uh, which may be beneficial for complementary uh, compression techniques, uh, you're likely to destroy that sparsity. So, and similarly, when you perform quantization aware training, when tuning your weights to your weights to particular quantization scheme. Uh, similar effect could happen to both pruning and clustering. So the idea here is try to cascade all the techniques uh, in a particular sequence and make sure that every subsequent step doesn't destroy the effect of the previous step. Uh, and uh, some of our internal tests suggested that, yeah, this idea actually works. And here is a, a bit of a, a uh, summary of our internal results uh, for uh, speech recognition and for keyword supporting networks, uh, quite important uh, use cases for embedded, um, uh, for embedded systems. Um, here the, uh, the blue um, uh, figures are 100% normalized uh, performance and uh, error metrics like error rate, uh, SRAM bandwidth, flash bandwidth, SRAM size. Uh, an inference time, and the the red orange ones are the same metric after after the collaborative optimizations, and we can see that generally speaking, at the at the cost of relatively small uh, uh, drop in accuracy, we can gain quite a bit in terms of model size and uh, improvement in inference time. Uh, 
So, so how that transfers into kind of real life and using the real tools that are currently available in GitHub in terms of formal optimization toolkit. Uh, here, uh, some preliminary results for uh, premium equitization that we're training and clustering equitization that we're training. And we can see how combining uh, pruning with consideration training gives advantage, accuracy adv uh, advantages over the just pruned post-train uh, post converted model uh, while maintaining the effect of pruning. Uh, so, and, and the same for clustering. So we can see that uh, uh, post-train quantization uh, will normally degrade the accuracy of the clustered model. However, using QAT, we can recover it to, to an acceptable level. And in the end, uh, I wanted also to share results, uh, some of the results that we of our experiments on 16-bit activations. This is another technique that we recently continued to, to TensorFlow Lite. And what it does basically adds that yet another tool in the model uh, and in, in developer's toolbox allowing to find that uh, uh, balance between, uh, between model size, development effort, and model accuracy in the end. Um, and uh, we can see that for some use cases, 16-bit uh, uh, activations may give uh, an easy solution for quantization problems, uh, such as, for example, a uh, mobile band transformer network, where uh, they're not particularly friendly to integer 8 quantization without uh, additional effort, whereas with in 16 we were able to achieve at very low effort, we were able to achieve uh, performance which is uh, comparable with the original flow to the model uh, yeah the same as with the deep speech, with the deep speech uh, model here so finally uh, on our journey for enabling like full collaborative flow in uh, tensorflow upstream model uh, model optimization toolkit uh, we're now finalizing the, the last the last contribution, which will enable full flow of pruning, clustering, quantization, where training with subsequent uh, post, uh, conversion into fully quantized TF Lite model. That PI is currently actually un, uh, under review upstream, so interested people can go and try it. Um, the main uh, takeaway is that uh, if you want to achieve the best performance. To extract the best uh, the best inference numbers to have smallest model, uh, uh, you you have to optimize your model for the target hardware. There is no uh, there's no way around it. Um, and best results according to our uh, uh, to our experience are achieved by combining several techniques. You can achieve some results with pruning, you can achieve some results with, with clustering, but if you want the best balance between accuracy and performance, you have to uh, you have to use probably more than one technique, and this is where it is important to to have those techniques working well with each other. And uh, finally, the tools I spoke uh, I mentioned here they're all open source, uh, obviously free. Uh, and they all we, we all encourage, uh, we encourage everyone to get involved in the community, contribute new techniques, or test uh, the current ones and report your results. It will all uh, help uh, us to keep improving the tools and make them easier to use. Thank you very much. <laughs>